I think privacy is hard on Bitcoin. What I mean is when I say it's hard, it's I've been through your tutorials. I've read various things. I always feel like I'm just going to fuck something up here. Somewhere along the line, there's going to be a mistake I'm going to make. I'm, I'm not going to have the right privacy on my node. I'm not going to be using Tor in the right way. Like there's something, there's, there's so many different intricate parts to it that I'm pretty sure I'm going to screw something up. So I've kind of accepted now that I just don't really have it at the moment. It's not that I don't want it. It's not that I don't think anyone should have it. It's just a bit tricky. But at the same time, I can still benefit from the 21 million. I mean, it's yet to be seen if you can benefit from the 21 million because we don't know if you're going to be able to spend it in 10 years. Um, but I mean, that's it. that's in a scenario, therefore. Though, so we still have sovereign cur currencies and Bitcoin is being attacked at a state level because they don't want you to spend it at all. Bitcoin has not been attacked yet, really. It will get attacked more, first of all. Uh, maybe not the U.S., you know, but other other a lot of states will attack it. And it won't just be states. It'll be corporations. I mean, we see today in the digital privacy world, uh, you know, one of the main attackers are these corporations that monetize our data, right? They monetize all the data, Google, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, and they're basically these, these corporate surveillance machines. They make a bunch of money off of it, and then they end up partnering with governments or com getting compelled by governments or selling that information to third parties who then do the same. Um, so it will be a bit of a corporate state partnership type of situation. And depending on where you are in the world, it could be different for your threat model. But I just, to go back to what you said, is it's very interesting that you said that because this is not obviously the first time I've heard that. The meme with privacy is always that people say, I'm not concerned because I have nothing to hide. That's not what that, I'm saying. No, I know. One sec. That's not the real thing I hear. What I usually hear is I am so fucked that I'm going to screw something up anyway, so it's not worth me dealing with it, right? And what I would say to that is ultimately this is not just a Bitcoin conversation. This is a digital privacy conversation. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to feel overwhelmed in the current state that we're in, in terms of our digital tools. You know, everything around us is a panopticon. Everything's spying on us. It's all connected. You make mistakes, they last forever. You know, the Streisand effect. And you put something on the internet, you're probably not gonna be able to get it off. It's even worse with Bitcoin because you have this ledger the Bitcoin blockchain that should outlive all of us, this immutable le ledger that can't be changed. Um, so you hear this a lot, and it's completely reasonable to be overwhelmed. But what I would say is little improvements do help. Perfect is not the goal. The goal is not perfect. The goal is to make small improvements. And if you talk about on the privacy side, a perfect example in the privacy on Bitcoin side is taking your Bitcoin off of exchanges and holding self-custody yourself. I do that. Now, is that... A massive privacy benefit? No, but obviously it's a better benefit than someone else holding all your keys and knowing every single transaction you make, right? You're taking a, you're taking a step in the right direction. So, and then if I would say on the digital privacy world, it'd be like unplugging your Alexa. Don't have you know a smart home assistant in your house that just has a microphone on all the time. I'm not saying you need to be James, uh, you know, be uh, what is it, James Born? No. James, Jason, Bourne. Jason Bourne. You don't need to be like Jason Bourne. You don't have to be like a secret agent, but little things, you know, little little things around your daily life, reducing your reliance on Google, reducing your reliance on social media, not have, you know, not sending your DNA to some third party company. Like these things make a significant difference both individually, but at scale, it helps everyone because at scale, you're, you're basically, you're, you're hurting this mass surveillance mechanism that is at place where almost everybody's information is just constantly being sucked up and stored forever. And then it might not be used against us today. It could be used against us in 10 years. It could be used against us in 20 years. You don't know what the situation will be at that point. Yeah, I, I wonder whether it's uh, edge cases that are banned, you've, you've given them, or it's a full-blown attack. They don't want you to spend any Bitcoin, like holding or spending Bitcoin is considered criminalized but i think at that point it almost loses the majority of its value that becomes a really viable scenario. i don't think so i think i think once again bitcoin it means different things to different people of course um i think long term it loses its its potential but i think short term 
first of all, it's way easier to capture Bitcoin than it is to kill it. Uh, every day that Bitcoin survives, it gets stronger. Capturing Bitcoin is relatively easy, and and we, it's not a hundred percent effective, but you can capture a lot of people uh, relatively cheaply, relatively easily. You make an example out of a few people, most will comply. I mean, we saw that with twenty twenty, with all of uh, the COVID responses, stuff like that. We see it. We see it absolutely all the time. Um, so capturing it is easier. Corrupt politicians, rich businessmen can also make money on captured Bitcoin. They really can't on destroying Bitcoin. So I don't think it's going to be a scenario where they actually go for the kill shot, try and kill Bitcoin. And I don't think I don't I, I don't think any government can right now. Maybe maybe if the U.S. government put like everything they had to do it, but they would never do that. That was just that's just not even a, a realistic possibility. But capturing it is happening today. Like I said, 99 percent of people are coming in on these KYC regulated on ramps. A lot of them are giving them custody, giving them full ID information, you know, social security number, everything fully linked to their ID. So. But there's a group of Bitcoiners that have come in. As Bitcoin adoption has increased and they are more corporate, they're more regulatory friendly, right? You always hear the words regulatory clarity. You don't hear government attack on Bitcoin. For those people, Bitcoin becoming more captured could be a buy signal. So as it happens in the short to medium term, Bitcoin can pump on that news. Like there's a there's a bunch of, um, you know, massive institutional funds and rich people who are waiting on the sidelines basically for the all go ahead. You know, you can hold Bitcoin, just don't spend it on anything we say you can't spend it on. And they're already living their lives, not spending their things on things they're not allowed to spend it on. So they're cool with that. Price pumps. Bitcoin looks like it's doing really well. But as that's happening, the majority of people are getting captured. Now, in that scenario, when I work it out through my head, I still think Bitcoin becomes the reserve money of the world. I just think it's a more dystopian scenario. And that's why when people say, Matt, like if you care about Bitcoin, if you care about digital privacy, like why is your focus on Bitcoin? where it seems like privacy is maybe a secondary priority or a third priority. And the reason is because ultimately it's not up to me whether or not Bitcoin is the successful money of the world. I've come to the conclusion that I think that's going to be the case. So what is the most productive uh, place to focus my time, both for myself and for the movement? Because I'm thinking about myself, but I'm also thinking about my grandkids, right? And I want my grandkids, I don't want them to have cuck money. I don't want them to have fully regulated surveillance money. I want them to have freedom money. I want them to have money that they can control. So where is the most productive places that I could put my time? And that's on ensuring that Bitcoin users are more aware of the trade-offs, that tools that are helping Bitcoin users maintain financial privacy are getting supported, uh, that those developers are getting feedback, that they're getting funding. Um, that users are getting education. That's why the focus is there is because I've already come to the conclusion that with or without me, with or without you, with or without anyone in this room, Bitcoin will be the money of the world. So it's up to us to make sure that it's actually freedom money and not cuck money. And privacy isn't just important to avoid uh, state capture around rules that we can't use it for. It's just a fundamental right. Right, but like... And even if you just do in general practice, I mean, we talked about HRF earlier. Hmm. Like I met people who, you know, parents were in jail for thinking things that were against the the Chinese the Chinese government, right? Yeah. Like these are very real issues for people today. But even a, a real issue in the UK. But you, if you want to do a less, and we saw with the Canadian truckers, yeah. right? Their bank accounts were getting frozen. Well, GoFundMe was getting frozen. But one second, if we go back even to just like a simpler way, way more fundamental transaction. If I'm getting paid in Bitcoin, and this is the thing, a lot of people that talk about these things aren't getting paid in Bitcoin. More and more of my income is Bitcoin. So I am getting paid in Bitcoin. If I'm getting paid in Bitcoin, my boss shouldn't know what I spend my money on. And the place, if I go buy a sandwich, like the sandwich shop owner shouldn't know how much I make. Like that is fucking ridiculous. Uh, so, So, I mean, I think for most people, if they see that, they understand, especially the older generations, they've been using cash their whole lives. Unfortunately, the younger generations basically just chose not to use cash. 
they're used to that as a privacy setup for them, a basic financial privacy when it comes to transactions. But they're used to the fact that if they hand over cash, the person they're buying the sandwich of doesn't know where that Correct. cash went previously. Correct. Yeah, you know, they used to if they spend on their card again, they can't see that the. Instead, like thirty corporations are yeah tracking you and selling your data and shit in in a different way. Yeah, but but what I'm saying is and the credit is, cards are surveillance cards as of, well. Of course, but what I'm saying there isn't that connection. There isn't this right. Blockchain. The shop owner doesn't necessarily yeah. Th- there isn't so that that's a there's a lot for people to learn. It's a big step. Hundred percent. Yeah, and yeah, you know, I think Bitcoin becomes the money of the world. What I would say to you is, as a like a friend saying, I just don't know how many people are really going to make this effort. We've got whatever three billion, three billion on Facebook. They obviously don't care about privacy because they're on Facebook. Yeah, we know. Well, I mean, they, I wouldn't say that, but yeah. Well, I think everyone. I think a lot of them. Aware. Are, no, I think a lot of them aren't aware of the trade offs. Really, I think, I think people are going to get burnt. Look, we've never been in in the greater digital privacy conversation we've just never been in the situation before like people have never had this much of their lives digital yeah so what's going to happen is every year there's just going to be bigger and bigger leaks like people are just going to get more and more fucked and as that happens it will become more obvious to people but i think the overwhelming majority of people that have like an alexa in their home or whatever they don't they don't think of it as a surveillance device they don't think like oh shit that random conversation i had with my wife you know three months ago got leaked because some hacker, you know, stole it from Amazon and pushed put, posted on the internet. But I do think these hacks and these uh, uh, devices, people are becoming more aware. Yeah, they they are, but they're not yet. I think some, I, but I think there's like uh, an ambivalence to it sometimes as well. Like it's that almost an acceptance. All right, fuck, I'm being tracked everywhere. I just like accept, like I accept Google. I mean, like I stuff. see it every time. Every time a new hack up happens, a new leak happens. Uh, you see more and more people start to take steps to improve their situation. It happens every time. Does everybody do it? No. It's hard But as well. there's, you know, maybe 5% of people that are affected. And the thing is, it's not even just the people that are affected. Like, um, if your father or your neighbor or someone has their identity stolen, gets completely fucked, like, that's a wake-up call for you as well, right? Yeah. It, it's it's a hard transition. I've been I've tried it a couple of times, like, there's been times where I've gone to like DuckDuckGo instead of, well, right. they're, they're fucked now as well again, aren't they? They're a little bit, yeah. yeah. But they're still significantly better than uh, than uh, Google. Google. Yeah. Um, but the results kind of suck. Yeah, because um, they don't spy on you yeah. as much. They just kind of suck. Um, mm. You have it with your phone when you start, you know, if you choose not to have, say, an iPhone, say you want uh, one of the Android phones. De-Google the Android. Yeah, and then there's... <laughs> Trade-offs. Everything has trade-offs. Everything has trade-offs. At the core of the privacy conversation is the main trade-off is convenience versus privacy. Of course. If you want the most convenient situation, it probably comes at the sacrifice of privacy. But the beauty, like the beauty of Bitcoin is one of the beauties of Bitcoin to me is that on the trade-off balance of security and convenience. Bitcoin goes way on the security side. And you see this with Chitcoin land, right? Where you see yeah. like super centralized chains like Solana that have cheap fees, um, that maybe have more user-friendly stuff uh, involved because they're centralized. That's at the sake of security and robustness, right? And Bitcoin has chosen the opposite because it's a main protocol, right? It's the, it's the protocol layer. It needs to survive everything else. Otherwise, well, we're, we're just building on quicksand. To me, you have this base protocol and then you have all these different ways of interacting with it on top of it. And there's going to be trade-offs along all of them. Um, and the cool part is for the first time in human history, you basically can use this money protocol with the trade-off balance that you choose to use it. If I want to use dollars today, I don't have many options. I, have, I can use cash. Um, I can use credit card or I can use the digital payment apps. And there's really not that much. There's a big trade off difference between cash and the two digital payments. But whether you're using a Visa card or an Amex or Venmo or PayPal or Revolut, it's basically you're basically in the same exact type of trade off situation. What about stable coins? Same. I mean, I would say, you know, stable coins obviously have a bunch of different trade off balances. Yeah. Most of them are just straight up pegged uh, 
you know, an issuer like Circle or Tether is holding money in the bank and they say one to one, if you have the token, you know, you're trusting us and and you take that. Um, they obviously have, but if you compare that, so you compare that to Bitcoin and and you're getting some convenient factors in that it's attached to a money that is currently the most desired money in the world, which is the US dollar. Um, you're getting fast transactions, you're getting low fees. And, but then your, your trade-off is you're not getting censorship resistance, right? You're, you're trusting this third party. This third party is going to get regulated. They're kind of in this, you know, little, uh, they're in this grace period where they haven't been f- fully regulated like a PayPal has. Um, but they will. That will happen. Um, but they give you a different trade-off balance than something like PayPal and Venmo. And then Bitcoin's over here. gives you a different trade-off balance. But my point is, with Bitcoin, users will be able to use it completely regulated, not censorship resistant at all. They'll be able to use it on the full other extreme where they'll be able to use it privately, sovereignly. No one can tell them how to use their money, how to hold their money. And then there's going to be a bunch of different variations in the middle that you're going to be able to choose from um, rather than have, you know, a couple large payment corporations that are all basically following the same rules that are set from above. And in the world, if you want to talk about fairness, I mean, obviously I'm American, so I've been talking about U.S. regulators, but you know, U.S. regulators basically dictate how everyone else in the world gets to use their money, right? Like when yep. we talk about KYC rules, there's KYC rules for exchanges. The reason BitMEX went down, even though they were based in the Seychelles, is because it wasn't enough for BitMEX to say, Americans, you're not allowed to use it. America wanted them to take the identity information of every single person in the world just to make sure they weren't American, right? So, so there's a... There's not just a sovereignty question for individuals here. The current financial system poses a sovereignty question for every single country on earth and their citizens.